God bless you. Brother Harvey, you better get up here quick. You've got so many notes you won't get through to next month. <laughs> Amen. Praise be to God. Isn't the Holy Spirit just a, a great feeling? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Let's, let's just keep that serious Amen. thought and keep the Holy Spirit here. And uh, let us guide us as we go through the Word of God today. Amen? Yes. Uh, today I wanted to do something just a little bit different. You know, it seems like any time in the Word of God, when God is quoted, when God is speaking, I've noticed it seems seem like when He speaks, He's basically doing three things. First thing I find that when God speaks, he's, He makes a statement. And so, uh, uh, like when He makes a, a statement, well, like for instance, John 14 14, He says this statement, If ye shall ask anything in My name, I will do it. And so that's a statement that God has made. And he was quoted in the Bible in saying that. And, and so a lot of times those statements too, we call those promises of God. And those are great things that we can stand on. You know, and also the second thing I find that God does when, when he is uh, speaking in his word is that he issues a command. So sometimes he tells us a commandment. And uh, an example of that would be, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We find that in Exodus 20 and 8. And so all these things are important. Everything in his word is important. But especially when God speaks, uh, I think it's even more important. Now, the third thing that I found that God does when he speaks and at first, when you think about it, you, you kind of think about, well, this is kind of funny. Why would God do this? And the third thing I find is that God is asking a question. Now, here we are. We all know and believe that God is omniscient. He knows everything. Matter of fact, He's the one who created all of the answers to every question that could ever be. So, at first appearance, it would be funny for God to ask a question. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to see why God asks questions sometimes. Okay? Now the first, first, now these verses that we're going to look at we're going to go way back in Genesis. In fact, we're going to go to Genesis 3, starting with verse 8. And God asks some questions here. And remember back in uh, Genesis 3, uh, this is where Adam and Eve, when they fell, when they created the first sin that ever came into the world. Right? And so here God... Now, God frequently came down into the garden, into the cool of the day, and he walked with Adam and Eve. He talked with Adam and Eve. He had fellowship with them. He, he, they had a great um, uh, thing going with God, right? And so then after they fell, then God came down, because he wanted to walk and talk with them. And in Genesis 3 and 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and he said to him, now here's the first question we're going to look at. Where art thou? So here God is asking them, where are you? 
Now, if we, if we allow our own understanding, if we allow what the world teaches us, then we would naturally assume that when he asks, where are you, that actually God is, is, is saying, where are you geographically located from where I am? That, that would be our natural thought, that, that that's what God is asking. But, like our sister last Wednesday pointed out, that we can't always look with our carnal mind when we're reading the Bible. Sometimes we have to also uh, look at the Bible spiritually. So let's get in there and see what God is really saying when he told Adam, where are you? The first thing we can learn, or the first thing we need to learn about when God asks questions is since we already know that God already knows the answers. He knows everything. So the first thing we know and we can state that God does not ask a question for his own benefit. He's not asking a question so that he can get some information that he didn't know. Because he already knows it. So we know he doesn't ask questions for his benefit. Now, there's only two sides to this. There's, there's God and there's Adam and his wife. So therefore, if he's not asking for the benefit of himself, then we know he's asking for the benefit of Adam and his wife. We know then that when God asks us questions, it's not for God's benefit, it's for our benefit. Okay? So, now what is God really asking then? If he's not asking where geographical, where are you located, you know, from me, you know, because if that was the question, then Adam could have said, oh, well, I'm about 30 feet <coughs> to your left behind this big tree because I'm hiding, right? Well, God didn't ask him for that kind of an answer. So what is God asking really when, when he asked Adam, uh, where are you? Because actually God already knew he's fallen. God already know that there is sin in the world now. And we have to remember before that happened, God and now had a great relationship with each other. And so now, actually, God is asking, where are you? He's actually asking, where is your relationship between me and him is now? Yeah. Amen. So, before the fall, they had a great relationship. Mm -hmm. After the fall, now the relationship is damaged because of their bad decisions that they made. But you might think that God came down to uh, really get on to, uh, to Adam. You might think that he, he came down because he's gonna, uh, he wants to punish him or, or whatever, but you know, if you really look at it this way, he's, he's asking, where is your relationship between me and you now? So actually, God's questions to Adam after the fall was, is really full of grace. The question is intended to draw man in rather than drive him out. Thus the question, where are you? The words form a question rather than a command or an accusation. This question is intended to draw man in rather than drive him out. 
God doesn't come to check up on you. Or he doesn't seek out all your wrongs doings. But he comes to generally seek your company. He comes because he wants your friendship. He wants to stroll in the evening cool with you. He's asking everyone here now, where are you? He's asking me that. Amen? That's something we all need to think about and contemplate. Where are you? Now, let's go on to the second question that God asks. And if we read that verse again, those verses again, and just go a little bit further, and it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And Adam and his wife hid from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees. And the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And then he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. That was Adam speaking. And then God asked his second question now. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Now, this is a fascinating question, I think, that God asked in the Bible. And, by the way, this, this answer, it, that question goes unanswered. Because Adam, uh, he didn't respond to this answer. And when, when he did speak, he was very elusive. So we were not told um, who told Adam that he was naked. So let's try to figure out what this question means. First, in order to understand this question, we've got to look back at Genesis. Let's go back a little bit to Genesis 2 and 25. And it says, and they were both naked, and the man and his wife was not ashamed. This is before the fall. So we understand God created them. They got, God created them perfect, just the way they were. They didn't need clothes. They didn't need anything. And they were not ashamed. So there was a time when Adam and Eve was naked, but they were not ashamed of it. Now here in chapter 3, they were naked, and they were aware of it, and they were ashamed. When Adam and Eve sinned, they introduced the awareness of nakedness and shame. When they fell, that was the first time that sin had entered the world. That was also the first time that shame entered the world. There was no shame before them. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is this a question of, of interrogation and confrontation? Is that what God meant? when he asked them? When he asked, who told you you were naked? So in one way we can understand this question to be a, a one of interrogation and confrontation. This is the traditional understanding of the question, who told you you were naked? But you know, God uh, did want to interrogate him and confront him because God does want him to admit that he has sinned. He wants Adam and Eve to uh, confess their sins. So yes, part of this question is an interrogation and he's confronting them. But it's a question meant to expose their sin. 
And this view is supported by the question that immediately follows it. And the next question that God asked is, Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Now this additional question points back to the act of the disobedience on the part of Adam and Eve. It's kind of like saying, well, who told you that one little compromise would not hurt you? Certainly taken this way, the question I believe, in part, is one of God's interrogating and confronting Adam over his sin. But also we need to look at this question another way. I believe there's a second part of this question. But we also can see this question to be one of loving affirmation and acceptance. For we can see this question as a question of grace and acclamation. If we look at it this way, then we can say God is saying, He's saying, who told you you were naked? We might say that he is saying, who told you you're not pretty enough or smart enough? We can say that God might be saying, so who told you you were a wuss? Who told you that I did not love you? Who told you that you were ugly? Who told you that you will never be a good father? Who told you that you would never make a good mother? Who told you without a job you will not be worth anything? Who told you that you will never love again? Who told you that you will never amount to anything? Who told you it's too late to start over? Who told you that I cannot forgive you? God is saying, I told you that whatever. At one time, Adam and Eve were naked, and they were not ashamed. And now they feel ashamed because of their nakedness. What a great question. Do you have, I'm going to ask you guys, do you have any recollections of when you first discovered any shame? When you discovered that some people might have thought that you were doing something silly, or that you were dumb in something, or they're that you were not good at something, or not worthy of being your friend. What lies have been told you by other people, or even by your, to, to yourself? Whatever you were hearing from anyone else, God is still asking the question, who told you you were naked? God is still asking that question because in Christ, we are not naked. In Christ, we are not worthless. We're not hopeless. We're not dumb. We're not ugly. And we haven't been forgotten. In Christ, we are not naked. In Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he had clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself out with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Amen? So the question of one confronting an interrogation, or is this a question of affirmation and acceptance? Well, I say this question means both. I believe the question, God's question, who told you you were naked, is intended both to confront Adam, while at the same time assuring Adam that in spite of everything, God still loves him. And that he was still there to provide for him. (laughs) 
praise be to God. You know, we need to stop and think. You know, who told you you were naked? Who told you that you weren't good enough? Those are just lies. And they come from Satan himself. They may come through people, they may go come through the world, but it originated from Satan. Amen? You know, as I was going through these scriptures today, also I remember reading a, a little article, and this is a few months back, but when I was reading this, the scriptures, preparing for this, uh, I remember just a little article that I read. And it was a little publication is called Today's Christian. And what it was, it was it was a it was a mother who has a seven year seven year old daughter, right? And so uh, the mother in this article says that, well, my daughter, when it comes to the Bible and the words of God, she's a real deep thinker. So uh, she remembers a few weeks back that she discussed the fall of Adam and Eve and that was uh, introduced when sickness and diseases came into the world and she was explaining that to her daughter. Well, a week or so later, uh, her seven-year-old daughter, she gets real sick and she's not able to go to school. So now she's laying in bed, kind of a little bit weak and kind of feeling bad and she, maybe she's feeling sorry for herself, you know, and she looks up at her mother and says, man, if just, if they hadn't eat that uh, fruit, I wouldn't be sick today. And then when her, when her mother is trying to think of something, you know, a good little, little re reply, the little girl all of a sudden pops up and says, yeah, but if they haven't eaten that fruit, we would all be sitting here naked right now. <laughs> so we can think about that for a little bit. But remember, there wouldn't be any shame here. That's right. Amen. <laughs> okay, so look. let's look at the very next question that God has asked. And of course, that's the one where it says, Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee thou should not eat? And that was the last part of Genesis 3 and 11. Now, this is a simple question. Now, in the English teachers, uh, they would call this a closed question. In other words, this is a simple question that just requires a simple yes or no answer. But when it comes to Adam, see, he saw it as a very complicated question. So God confronts him uh, to that point, and for the first time, Adam is in a very tight spot. To understand the full importance of this question, we have to go back to God's first instruction to Adam. Back in Genesis 2 and 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. In other words, he says he's to work in the garden. Verse 16, it says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou may freely eat. Verse 17 says, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou shalt eat, therefore surely shall surely die. Now that's God's way of saying, now you can eat all the apples and pears and peaches, you know, all the fruit you want to eat. But do not eat from that wild fruit fruit bearing tree because it's going to taste like death. 
Now the significance of this divine command is seen in that it, this is the first command, commandment that God gave to Adam. And it's the first commandment in the Bible. Now on top of that, in Genesis, in chapter 3, it's the first recorded time of man's first transgression. In other words, the first time sin has entered the world. In Genesis 3, after being enticed by the, by the serpent, Eve gives in to eating the fruit of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we can read that in Genesis 2 and 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree uh, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now this, of course, is a clear violation of God's instructions from Genesis chapter 2. So this is God's first confrontation with man. And in Genesis 3, 9 to 11, in these verses, God confronts Adam with these three questions. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? And have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Mankind's first reaction. And in Genesis 3 and 12, now here's Adam's response to when God asked, had you eaten from that tree that I told you not to? And the man said, the woman who thou had given to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now notice, in response to God's question, Adam, did, he did three things here. First of all, he tries to evade the question. Okay. And, and this is a rather long sentence. It wasn't until the final three words that Adam finally admits to eating of the fruit. Secondly, he tries to shrink his responsibility by blaming Eve. Remember he said, but God, the woman, she's the one that gave you the proof. So she's, he's trying to put some of the blame on the woman. Now, isn't that like, just like a guy to try to blame the women? <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> now the third time, the third thing that God, that Adam is trying to do here, and this is this kind of blew my mind when, uh, but um, he says, "The woman that you gave me is now trying to put some blame on God for his sin." It, isn't that just like all of us? I mean, every time we sin, every time we make a mistake, every, every time we fall down, whatever, we're trying to blame everybody else. You, you know, it's, they're the ones who made me. You know, the devil made me. Or, or whatever comes up. But we're always trying to make some, some kind of excuse why we did something. <coughs> well, I tell you, Adam at the end, he finally admitted that yes, I ate them. And we should own up ourselves to what we do. Nobody makes us do anything. The devil cannot make us do anything. He tempts us, but we're the only ones who say yes or no. Amen. Okay, now there's there's one other point I want to make here. 
all of humanity at this time was guilty of transgressing God's instructions. In other words, there was only Adam and Eve. So that's the complete humanity. That they're the only two on the world. So when they sin, that means the whole world, everybody in it, sin. Since both Adam and Eve were guilty, sinfulness was universal. It was all around the world. And this is further supported by the fact that the Hebrew word Adam, Adam actually means mankind. So by virtue of Adam's transgressions, all of mankind was plunged into the guilt of sin. <clears throat> and so now we, we come up to God's eternal solution to this problem. And if we look at Genesis 3 and 14, we're going to see that it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field, upon thy bed, on thy bed, your stomach shall you go, and dust thou, thou eat all the days of thy life. Yep. And I will put enmity between thee and thy woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and it shall bruise his heel. Now I want you to know something. Genesis 3 and 15, where it talks about, I will put enmity between thee and thy woman, and between thy seed and her seed, I shall bruise thy head, and I shall bruise thy heel. Many scholars, most people who study the Bible for most of their lives, they quote this verse as being the first gospel. Now way back in Genesis, that brings up the question, why would they call this the gospel? The gospel we know is, is the life story. It's everything that Jesus taught. This is, I don't know how many years before Jesus was born uh, so that he could die on the cross and made a way so that we can have our salvation. So uh, some people are going to wonder why would scholars call this verse the first gospel. So we're going to take a look at that. So, you know, we're, we're talking about in here it's talking about the woman's seed, right? It's the woman's seed that is going to bruise the head of the snake. And the snake is going to bruise the woman's seed by his heel. Now, when we're talking about a woman's seed, we're talking about your children, right? Seed doesn't stop there. A woman has a, a child, they grow up, and they have children. They grow up, and they have children. They grow up, and they, they have children. Well, guess what? Then Jesus Christ is the seed from Eve. From Eve. We all understand that. So now we can understand why so many people would call this verse the first gospel. Here we're saying the seed of Adam and Eve is eventually going to come to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who made a way for our salvation. And when he made a way for our salvation, he did exactly what God said. And uh, 
Jesus was taking his heel and crushing the head of that serpent who is Satan. So we can all understand that. Right? Amen. So the Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 5 and 14. Nevertheless, if I, Romans 5 and 14 says this, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them, and that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who is the figure of him that was to come. Verse 15, but not as an offense, but also as a free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abound unto many. We can also see it in another scripture. We can put it in another way. 1 Corinthians 15 and 21. 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 says it this way. For since man came, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen? Amen. Amen? So maybe now we have a little better understanding of why God asks questions and also uh, some of these verses that we went through today. Amen? Amen. So I just want to leave that question for all of us to think about. Where are you today? We just want to thank you, Father, for, for the service today. Thank you for the word that we heard. We thank you for your comfort and your leadership and your guidance, Father. And we just give you all the glory and we give you all the praise. And Lord, we just ask you to keep each and every one safe as they go out on the highways today and bring them all back at the appointed time. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.